Mr. Carbajal, will you engage with me for one minute so I can understand some? Sure. Just listening to your line of questioning, are you advocating that no, a, a non-U.S. flag vessel receive no protection? Just no. What I'm saying is that, uh, you know, I appreciate all commerce. It's important when you consider the global trade, the dependence we have. But I think that taxpayers, the United States taxpayers, would want us to prioritize, first and foremost, American taxpaying companies. Very good. Just thank you for clarifying that. Um, I agree with that. I'd love to see agreement on that issue as it pertains to our southern border and prioritizing Americans first. Uh, I think that's something that we should take that same ideology and apply it there, not to conflate the issues, but I think they're similar, and so I was glad to hear you bring it up in that way as it relates to, to flagged vessels. Um, I want to go to a couple of things that were brought up here. And uh, Mr. Ralby, start with you. Uh, you used the term persuaded by uh, as it relates to responses uh, that the U.S. could put forward. And the, just the first question would go to the Biden administration's policies towards Yemen, uh, taking them off the foreign terrorist organization list. They've received about three to three and a half billion dollars in aid since being taken off that. Has that persuaded them not to attack? Uh, let me clarify, the Houthis are 100 percent not the government of Yemen. So Has it persuaded, though, uh, the Houthis, they're Yemeni, correct? They do not see themselves as Yemeni, no. Uh, they are physically occupying territory in Yemen, but the Houthi movement sees itself as temporarily occupying Yemen in advance of a greater on, uh, attempt to take over. They currently control 30% of the territory of Yemen and 70% of the population. 75% uh, of that population is under the age of 29. So they are, they are revolutionizing a very young population, but they do not see themselves as Yemeni. And, you know, they may not be the government, but it's always an important question to ask whenever you're looking at our foreign policy is, does our aid, does our foreign policy support what we want out of each individual country? Because kind of going back to what Mr. Carbajal said, it has to represent the American taxpayer, right? And does that three and a half, three to three and a half billion support what we want out of Yemen in towards a policy terms the United States, towards the United States of America? I would say not. Maybe you, you want to have the argument I, I, in that I, way. I, but I would agree that our foreign policy towards Yemen uh, is, is uh, failing in, at the moment in that we have, for several administrations consistently, failed to bolster the Yemen government. We have, we have focused our attention on the Houthis uh, since the outset of the coup in, in 2015, um, but we have not provided the wherewithal. In 2018, the U.S. Uh, was part of a, a major effort to prevent the government of Yemen from retaking the port of Hodeidah on the Red Sea coast. That is now a, a critical strate strategic failure on our part, because if the government of Yemen controlled that sea access, we would perhaps not be having the same conversation we're having today. And so uh, I agree that we need to, to rethink our foreign policy towards Yemen, particularly because Yemen has long been the sort of forgotten corner of the Middle East. It's a very sad reality. And so we've not paid enough attention to understanding as well the Houthi mentality, which is why, to the point of, of Mr. Babin and others, we need to strike back, but our way of striking back has to be geared towards providing benefit to the U.S. public. If we just want to strike back for the sake of striking back, we may find ourselves actually making things worse. And that's unfortunately what seems to be happening right now. The Navy is very good at doing its job and, and fulfilling its mission, but that mission right now that it's been set on is unfortunately backfiring with regard to protecting shipping, protecting seafarers, and making commerce free-flowing. I don't agree with liberal mentality like that. We're Americans. If somebody hits us, there's going to be a reckoning and we're going to hit back. And that's just the American way. And it should always be the American way. Flat out. I want to go to some different questions uh, at this point. I want to talk about range, armaments, reconnaissance, maneuverability, quantity, uh, capabilities. This is advanced in terms of these drone systems throughout not just conflict uh, between United States of America and vessels, but we saw this going on with Saudi Arabia and Houthis and the conflicts that have taken place there. Um, are, are we dealing for the vessels with strictly radio or line of sight? Or do you have another capability with which you are able to, to track the, uh, the inbound drone strikes? Um, I Generally speaking, what the military operators have said is to use some established lines of communication, uh, 
via CENTCOM or through UKMTO secondarily, and that the first should come through uh, VHF, which obviously has some uh, downside because everyone listens to VHF 16, including the bad guys, uh, but also that they uh, offer uh, satellite communication uh, options where if you call them, they will pick it up, but that's not a secure line of communication. Uh, then, of course, we have you know, some ability to have awareness of what's going on to the extent that AIS is being used. That sends a signal um, from other vessels in the area, too. But obviously, the bad guys in the region are not going to have AIS transponders on if they have them at all. I have many more questions I'd love to ask you guys on armaments and reconnaissance and maneuverability. But my time has ended. I appreciate the increase in time, Mr. Chairman. Hey everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed the video, please click like and subscribe. I will be back on YouTube with more exclusive content, so stay tuned.